Welcome to the Furman Woods Contemporary Art Podcast, guest curated and presented by Subterra. In search of solace in this precarious world, we emerge from ocular darkness. Rays of light pierce through the nocturnal, and in these twinkling soundscapes, we are reminded that we are part of something greater than ourselves. As we navigate these curious and luminous spaces, we will explore artist talks, discussions, and original commissioned sound art. Welcome, dear listeners, to our next installment of Love and Light on the podcast. This episode features a discussion between me, Becky McRae, and Jason Singh. Becky McRae is an artist whose intersectional climate and nature-focused practice seeks to playfully break down boundaries between art, activism, and everyday life. Jason Singh is a sound artist, nature beatboxer, producer, DJ, curator, and performer. He follows a multi-sensory and cross-species approach to sound and music through an exploration of the natural world, voice, and a wide range of music technologies. So, although our plan had originally been for the three of us to speak together, it didn't quite occur as planned. But... The conversation that ensued between me and Jason, and then later between me and Becky, has resulted in a fragmentary and poetic discussion whereby both artists allude to each other's work, even though the other one is not present. And, much in the spirit of love and light, seem to kind of supernaturally connect through the medium of sound. Peppered throughout the following conversation, you'll also hear moments of each artist's field recordings, which melt together into a rich audio tapestry. Becky tells us about her Intuition Maps, which is a co-created artwork inviting participants and visitors to reflect on animal instincts, their own and that of the more-than-human world. It aims to generate a sense of solidarity and interconnectedness with nature and each other. Set in the woodland in Urchester Country Park, Intuition Maps presents a new and unexpected walking route, guided by neon waymarks that lead visitors on a journey through the landscape. These waymarks, crafted to attract and provide sanctuary for the Red Admiral Butterfly, a species now overwintering in the UK due to climate change, are both functional and symbolic, embodying the project's themes of migration, empathy, and resilience. The project was co-created with local communities through workshops that explored instincts, migration routes, and speculative climate scenarios. Participants contributed to the final artwork by making a new walking route based on their sensory experiences and instincts. Participants, maps, and local wildlife data were fed through an AI algorithm to help generate the new route, blending human and non-human intelligence in a unique and collaborative process. Jason Singh, on the other hand, tells the story of his journey in creating I Bring My Body to This Place to Observe the Coming and Going of Life which was a sound installation during the summer of 2016, which explored themes of home, separation, and migration for both people and wildlife. Installed in the North Bird Hide at Titchmarsh Nature Reserve, Jason's installation was the culmination of months of research into the social history around Thrapston, which unearthed connections between Northamptonshire and Washington, D.C., Although Thrapston is a small town, not well known outside of Northamptonshire, it has a significant link to the USA. 
Sir John Washington, the brother of George Washington's great-grandfather, was mayor of Thrapston in the 17th century and lived in Montague House on Chancery Lane. Travelling to Washington, D.C., Jason interviewed Faith Davis Ruffins, the curator at the National Museum of American History's Smithsonian Institution. For I Bring My Body, these interviews were interwoven with thoughts from American residents living on the outskirts of Thrapston, local stories, conversations, birdsong from George Washington National Forest, and field recordings from both Thrapston and America. The resulting soundscape, which was slowly activated upon entering the height and broadcast gently within, offered a reflection on the meaning of home and presented an alternative perspective on the emotive subject of migration. So, without further ado, here are the conversations with Becky and Jason talking about these works. Um, so, well, the original sort of commission came in in 2016 um, from Fermin Woods, um, and uh, it it was kind of the idea was to sort of put a piece that would go into a bird hide, um, Palmer's bird hide in uh, Old Winkle Lake uh, Nature Reserve, and um, and the sort of initial idea was was that sort of like being in this being in this hide and sort of seeing the way that you know birds came and went uh you know over over time um just kind of sparked this thing of you know the just the and also just how people move you know mm. um so we started sort of like looking at different things around northampton and thrapston and just the sort of histories of places of you know and the people that were there and it sort of turned out that sort of george washington had roots you know from from northamptonshire really um, yeah um and uh and so for me that actually sparked a huge kind of inquiry you know about the impact that people have had especially from this place you know um uh who have then gone to other parts of the world and you know the and and what that has then sort of like you know what's transpired as 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 you know as those movements so yeah, so I basically wanted to kind of, you know, just look at that a little bit more. So, um, so the idea was that, okay, knowing that George Washington and, and his family were sort of like from Northamptonshire, um, and then you know went to uh, uh, to went to America, and and sort of like then what happened there? So I proposed to to, to Fermin Woods that you know what I'd like to do is do recordings here of people that I'd meet in Northampton and then go to Washington um, and, uh, and, and record, you know, and record people and birdsong there and kind of, and, and sort of, yeah, it, it collects people's stories, you know, of, of movement um, and, and also kind of coming from sort of semi-nomadic communities. There's a huge thing around home, like what, what is it, you know, and that inquiry and that question, um, I love speaking to people about that, you know. Um, so I went, so basically I, I met various people around Northamptonshire that would been that, that we sort of like located and found out about through Fermin Woods. Um, and there were students, there were people who worked in the military, there was, you know, academics, mm. a whole range of a range of people. And then when I went to America and when I went to Washington, DC. The idea was then that I would go from DC down to the George Washington National Forest and I would record birdsong. Um, so there was this kind of like almost like three, like a triangle of like, oh, I'm going to start here and I'm just going to go there and then I'm just yeah. going to go there and then I'm going to come back. But actually what kind of unfolded was absolutely unbelievable in terms of the, the people that I met. Mm. the stories that they shared you know around these around these thoughts and these ideas of home um and so the the actual piece the sort of the main voice that runs through it is um so it's Bath Ruffins Davis um and uh she, um she's a historian from the Smithsonian um university and uh and I got this opportunity to speak to her um and ask her this question around 
uh, migration and home and she just absolutely nailed it in terms of her her own personal experience her work as a historian who looks at you know migration and the movement of people um so she so we just had this really beautiful chat um you know around around these themes um, of migration and home and and the movement of people um and then basically from smithsonian i then went on to uh to the george washington national forest where initially i thought you know i was going to record just go into the woods and record birdsong but what sort of transpired was the experiences that I had meeting other people. Um, I'd kind, you know, when I got to um, when I got to the to the motel that I was staying at in that area, I would I would like turn up to places and people would say like, "Oh, you're Jason Singh, the artist from the UK." <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're staying at the motel, you know. Oh my god. And so there was these like really weird moments of kind of like people who were very, who felt like I had come to their place and the way that I was sort of treated was kind of like, you know, you, you are, you're here as someone that we know you, you don't know us, you know? Mm. And that was so like at moments and, you know, I'd get invited to these sort of classical concerts and everyone in the room kind of like, looked like Ronald Reagan and, you know, Nancy. <laughs> it was really <laughs> quite surreal, you know? Yeah sort of going oh yeah we know you know you're but but not even kind of like isn't it a surprise that we know who you are but just kind of like you know this is a fact we know who you are fact we know who you are um and you know and then also the kind of um the quite sort of troubling things that i'd experienced as well with 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 um issues around you know people of color and how they were sort of being treated you know uh, in that part of virginia um which was really you know quite quite weird um and and sometimes actually quite frightening um i had because also what had happened was is that when i was going from dc and driving down to, to to the to the george washington national forest i was given this i went to a hire company that hurts and they sort of like we'd booked a little tiny little car that would go but when i got there they said oh we haven't got your car you know mm. um, so i was i was like oh, okay and they said but but what we've done is we've upgraded you to another car so I was like, oh, all right, then great. And they said, it's a Ford Mustang, you know, convertible. So I I ended up driving in this <laughs> sports car. From, That's so, wild. So it was wild. So basically, already there's a you know, there's there's me moving around as as as, as me. And then I'm and, and added to that, I'm doing it in this convertible sports car. Um I'm sure so, drawing a lot of attention with that. Totally, you know. Yeah. So, you know, there was there was kind of like towns that I was going through where you could sort of see the Confederate flag was flying high. And I'd been warned that do not stop in those places, you know. Mm. But there was this kind of like fear and feeling of the other, you know. And at the same time, I was like intrigued. Like, well, I'd love to stop here and chat to people. But yeah, they were of course. But like, you know, very much going like, this is America you know like mm. and and you know be warned that you know and uh and then you know so whilst i was on that journey i met uh, i met an amazing uber driver from ethiopia who you know was telling me about his kind of experiences of home um i met people in the motels i met you know i, I went one day recording trying well trying to record this beautiful stream um and uh and, and this bird song that was kind of happening around that. And what I hadn't realized was it was turkey hunting season. Really? And so, yeah, so all of a sudden I'm sort of stood there with a microphone, you know, and next minute um, I've got these double barrel shotguns like pointing at me going oh like, God. like, who are you? Get out of the way. What are you doing here? You know, do you not know that this is full? This land is full of hunters like shooting. Wow. People? So I was like, wow, I had no idea. You know what a fortuitous or maybe not time to go and think about bird song exactly exactly so i was recording you know like i was kind of having these encounters of people who you know were sort of share in a sort of indirect way sort of sharing their experiences of who they were and what they were doing you know um and so i you know had moments where i was recording i went to do try and record the dawn chorus in in the forest and uh, 
And when I got back to the motel, they said like, oh, where have you been? And they were like, oh, I was in the forest just recording birdsong. And they were like, but you do know it's full of black bears in there, right? And, uh, <laughs> and I was like, uh, no, I didn't know. <laughs> um, so just so, 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 so things like that, where I was like kind of having these having these kind of like near experiences with nature and wildlife that I hadn't anticipated, but being quite, it was, I was quite naive, you know, mm, at that time mm. of kind of like, you know, I wasn't really sort of doing my research in terms of like, Hey, what, what, you know, what else is going on here? Yeah. I was just allowing it to kind of unfold. Um, and, and there was this, and there was these kind of like, every sort of experience had this kind of other side to it where they were like, you know, wow, you're crazy. Like you're just <laughs> you're this crazy Brit who's like come here and doing this recording yeah. um, and but all of that sort of really fed into in, in, into the piece you know and and some of and well a lot of it didn't make its way into the actual work itself because they were just experiences that were happening but it kind of really gave me an insight into the kind of yeah the human experience of movement you know mm. um, and just the things that people shared you know through like food through language you know through you know fashion um yeah through space you know um in the, in the places that I stayed and it was really 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 interesting you know like when I was in DC it's so weird because experiencing that part of America mostly through films you know um was kind of one thing and then sort of being in those spaces and like being in Washington DC you know and sort of seeing the White House and you know all you know all, all of that the mall and and then kind of going, oh, well, actually, you know, I really want to sort of use public transport. And people are like, you're crazy using public <laughs> transport. You know, like, whatever you do, don't use the tube system in D.C. because it catches fire. You know, and, yeah. then, and so, like, things like that, where I was kind of getting this insight into this other place, you know, and was really fascinating. Yeah. Um, you know, and, uh, yeah, just kind of gave me an appreciation as well that, of the of the way that different levels work for different people mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. um and uh and Faf, you know she spoke she speaks about that really really you know beautifully um in in the piece just in terms of yeah just how different people's experiences are that's just such a a wild kind of synchronicity almost to go to a place and to let the artwork or to let the kind of creative process reveal aspects of place that you maybe would not have encountered if you just went there on holiday or you know for no particular reason I suppose um yeah and it's something Becky talks about a little bit as well and re with regards to her Romani heritage in the essay that she wrote for Furman Woods um about like the use of divination in her in her practice and you know say she she says like she's not trying to tell the future but just that kind of allowing s patterns to emerge allowing synchronicities to happen and letting those kind of lead the path as well rather than you know having this preconceived well you will always have a preconceived notion but letting those those little strange occurrences weave the narrative as it were oh 100 percent. and it was it was that sort of thing of like every person that i met was a kind of a thread that then went on to inform the next thing that happened you know yeah so like being taken from this airbnb apartment by this you know wonderful like ethiopian taxi driver who then's taking me to the mall who's then taking me to you know just to me historian like just those those kind of like nodes you know of, of humanity that sort of tell you know join up to sort of tell this bigger this bigger story yeah um, definitely but I think that's also like really important in the way that I kind of create work is that there is the sort of the conceptualized idea you know and the thing that sort of like comes as a download in a way but then the way that that is sort of then moves and shifts you know and allowing that to kind of happen and inform what you do is really important because we kind of had like okay I'm going to go meet this person then I'm going to go there and meet and do that but not anticipating actually who are the who will be all the other people that you'll meet within that you know there's also this kind of like ethical consideration I suppose when you're um meeting maybe new communities maybe they're vulnerable maybe they're not and you're like trying to re respond creatively, but also not to be extractivist in your own 
work you know did you kind of have that feeling at all or did it feel like you were just navigating through spaces um and and kind of creating things with people or store like allowing the storytelling to be kind of almost like an oral tradition or like an oral history yeah definitely that the, the, yeah the, sort of definitely um sort of honoring the sort of oral storytelling mm. you know that yeah. um no matter which situation I was in somebody was telling me their story you know yeah. in some way and and really what I wanted to do was as well as kind of like be in dialogue with that but I also just wanted just to listen to that you of know? course and I think people are always actually quite grateful to be able to speak while being listened to in a really open yeah. way yeah no very very much so but one one thing that I that one thing I did sort of find in more of the sort of official situations that I was in was was really the pe- people's kind of um people sort of being careful about what they were saying Mm. and in terms of who may be listening but then also the possible implications of what they're saying the the you know what the effect that might have you know later down the line and so it was it it was quite apparent to sort of be in those rooms and kind of go okay this doesn't feel like a this doesn't feel like an open conversation yeah sure you know um and uh and that was something that was also sort of quite interesting that you know um yeah what you know who may be listening or who or who you know yeah and hearing people maybe censor themselves slightly that's right yeah, yeah. exactly exactly yeah um, totally but it was amazing like when I stayed at the motel like when we'd sort of looked on google you know and we're sort of looking at okay who you know this is the place that we're staying it's owned by this couple um and I remember in the sort of weeks leading up to it it was this it sort of went from like you know, yeah, blah, 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 and blah, 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 have this lovely more uh, motel. And then all of a sudden, the sort of reviews changed, you know, oh, I saw, you know, the sheets were dirty, the place was filthy, blah, blah, blah. Mm. I was thinking, oh, what's going on here? When I got there, uh, I was, I was basically like welcomed by this Indian woman who was at the reception. And I was like, oh, you know, um, nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. And I was expecting tom or norma i think whoever who it was and they said oh no we've taken over oh. and, and uh, we've in the last we've we've just recently taken over and uh, we now own it and um, we're from indian heritage and we lived in new jersey and now we we now, now own this hotel and it was very interesting to then go ah okay so when i saw those comments you know based upon those reviews that were happening before and then what were happening after it was really down to the fact that there was, you know, a level of racism going on wow. here. Wow, yeah. The new, the new owners. And they said, like, you know, yeah, we've sort of seen things and we're sort of dealing with, you know, with stuff. But this is what we do and we love doing it. And, you know, not everybody's like that. And we, we've had yeah. a few things come through. But that was also quite, you know, eye, eye-opening, you know. Um, and And also amazing of, like, I thought I was going to this motel and I was going to be eating in diners and... Mm sudden I'm having people you know the the owner saying oh we're going to make you some Indian food you know oh wow and and I was just like what and they're like oh yeah we're gonna make some paratas and some dal and we'll make you know some sabjis and I couldn't believe it that actually I felt at home yeah you know that that thing of like here I am inquiring about this idea of what it means to be home but actually I've got I'm with people who make me feel at home you know Mm -hmm. through through this kind of this common connection that we have with our with our heritage and culture. For some people, home is very clear. It's, you know, the house or the neighborhood or the city or the region I grew up in. And maybe my family has been in that place for many generations. Um, like my husband has a family that has lived in New York City, we know, since 1770. Okay, so, and today, most of the people who are in his extended family on both sides live between, you know, in sort of the hundred miles between northern New Jersey and the end of Long Island. The overwhelming number of those people live in that space, but he doesn't. He's lived in Washington for 35 years, and he has a few cousins that live, you know, in other parts of 
the United States. But I'm sure many of the people in his family would have no difficulty saying that home is this part of New York City and we have houses and property and this is our home. This is where our home is, which is utterly different than my experience. Where my house is, it's a small like cul-de-sac type thing. There's only about, I don't know, about eight houses, so not many. Um, very, well, it can be quiet. Um, the town itself is very small, which I like, but sometimes I get bored of it because there's not a lot to do. And I like to be adventurous and try things and do things. I don't like just sitting around doing nothing. Um, Spalding is, well, known for, well, they used to be known for the tulips, and we used to have, like, tulip parade, but that got stopped a little while ago, which is sad because we don't get, like, that many, like, I wouldn't say tourists, but, like, visitors come in. So it's kind of like we're disappearing off the map as such. Um, but, no, the town's more known for takeaways and nail bars and pubs, that's about it. There's not really much to it as such. I love it. I love it as uh, my second country and I feel I am part of it now. And uh, all the social issues, what concern everyone concerns me. I care for the country, I care for the economy, I care for the people. Uh, I care for, you know, it's just, uh, it's, uh, the future of my kids, my kids are Americans, you ask them, they say Americans like you, they say Brit. But there is also part of you, like uh, you missed. It's really hard to kind of um, be succinct about the project. Like it took ages to kind of like get it into a, this, this sort of like the short kind of interpretation version of it um but I'm gonna I'm just gonna kind of use that as a prompt to just just to kind of give a like an overview yeah but um so it's a it's a co-created artwork um and it invite, invites the participants who were involved in the the process of it and visitors who were who were experiencing like the final artwork to reflect on animal instincts so by that I mean their own, like we are animals, even though we may have many of us may have forgotten that we are. Um, yeah. And uh, that of the more than human world. So it does all of this in the context of climate change adaptation. So it's about observing instinctive mass movement of people and animals, uh, and drawing comparisons between the two, with the aim of generating a sense of connectedness um, between each other and the more than human world. But also, really importantly, one this is something I've realised like more and more. This is what my work is all about: is about seeding new narratives, uh, particularly narratives around empathy and solidarity and hope, like active hope, which you know increasingly we need um, in today's environmental and political climate. So. I worked in collaboration with Northamptonshire communities and local migratory species, plus lots of really interesting research partners uh, from the British Trust of Ornithology um, to um, uh, experts in human migration, like professors, um, and just people uh, actually really interestingly, um, a PhD uh, in Sweden, um, who I just kind of tracked down her work, and it was just super interesting. She she's particularly interested in um, migratory insects, um, but then combining using AI to be able to combine the um, the data. Let's call it data. Uh, that sounds like a very formal word for for what we <laughs> for, for what happened in the workshops. Um, but so so yeah, working with local communities, we we kind of it, it embodied workshops. We generated um, sort of like captured information around how 
you, mostly the young people who I worked with would respond to different climate scenarios. So I kind of took all of this, sort of worked with this information, plus the um, in, the information around migratory species uh, routes and flyways, for example, and fed all this for a custom AI algorithm. So this was something that I created and trained myself um, and then was able to create a kind of collective, I wouldn't really call it a map, it's more of a pattern, uh, and through looking at this pattern and through, uh, through combining all of this data, it was really clear, and I think we know this anyway, we're not so different. You know, humans aren't so different to migratory birds and insects or each other. So the artwork that resulted from all of this is a an unexpected um, woodland walking route, which is guided by waymarks. The waymarks are really bright neon colours, one of the reasons I use neon in my work a lot is because I'm trying to kind of punch through that like gilded vision of the British landscape that we have. And this idea that the um, art and like creative, which talks about nature has to be brown or green. Like it yeah, does. Yeah, so true. So yeah, like true. everything comes from nature, like all of these colors, you know, look at like bioluminescent coral and things like that. So, so I'm kind of using these colors as a, as a way of, yeah, as a kind of statement around that. So they're really bright also. Uh, because butterflies can um, are attracted to pink and yellow, so that's another reason why. Yeah. Um, and the waymarks help the the visitors to tread in the footsteps of the project's multi species participants, but also to tune into their own intuition. So it's really interesting because I've just done a chat with the BBC yesterday, and their kind of main take on it is like a new woodland route uh, created with AI, and it's like actually the point is that we've gone through this process and machine learning has been part of it but ultimately we're kind of we are driven by our instincts by our animal instincts so actually that's that's been a useful part of the process but you know our final kind of directives are taken from the the the, the biosphere that, that surrounds us and our own senses and intuition and instinct um so uh, so the roots and the kind of map or pattern that I've created, it's like very loose, very open, and it really invites visitors to tune into their instinct to navigate it. Um, the 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 way markers also have like slits in them so that they create um, a home for butterflies, specifically the red admiral, who is now overwintering in the UK, uh, particularly in uh, Chester Woods, um, due to the warmer winters that we're now experiencing so they're no longer yeah. migrating they're now they're now staying so the way marks are hollow and they provide a sanctuary so the big idea behind the project is sanctuary and they all face south so you can orient yourself south is really good for insect hibernation because it keeps them a little bit, bit warmer oh. as well and uh, the butterflies are attracted to the pink and yellow um yeah so it it's it's really yeah the whole project is an is an invitation to build on processes and patterns that come before to forge your own path and just to, sh to share traces of those with me you know be that hand-drawn maps or notes documenting environmental conditions or gps coordinates but to continue the process and keep building on that it's so interesting it's such a multifaceted project and I, I was actually one of my questions for you is you know how do you find that tension of like working between scientific data and then artistic processes because I, I find this kind of interdisciplinary way of working so interesting and it's so interesting to see how different artists approach these uh this way of working yeah so I I love process so but but in a really experimental way so the kind of process that I really enjoy is I kind of refer to it as creating a framework within which unexpected events can occur so I'm trying to sort of really kind of just keep letting go at like the, the different and that, that what's really interesting is that socially engaged are uh, is there's a lot of facilitation involved but working with AI it's it's kind of the same thing you're a facilitator in that process um so yeah all the different the, the, the great thing about this project was that I had really almost a year to work on it which really allowed me to kind of to flow through and to let the project evolve in its own way and there were times when it was things didn't quite go to plan and it was disappointing or frustrating but then it was just right okay well this is what I've been given and that's the thing with participation is that you have to just like 
relinquish control and that is actually the beauty of it and it is a it is a bit like that with AI as well you're sort of you're you're kind of you're exploring together and you're creating kind of guides maybe and even like the final artwork as well like reflects this process of creating marks or guides but whether or framework but what happens within that I can't control like a collaboration of chance and control and I just find that quite exciting yeah, definitely. We we spoke about that, Jason and I as well, the kind of, yeah, the unexpected turns that can happen. And I, I really was intrigued by you describing AI as an um, kind of crystal ball. Yeah. Uh, I, I love that because there is such a supernatural element to it you know it's it's not visible but it's got agency or it so it seems Mm. and it has a voice and Mm. it has a tone and I I yeah I thought your concept of training AI with love Mm. was was yeah just so interesting and has so much potential into the future you know um so uh, yeah I'm curious if you could talk about yeah that kind of training process and your relationship with it with the AI and how that evolved throughout the year and yeah Yeah. so so yeah it's really funny so uh, um I so initially I was going to collaborate with uh with some friends who were AI experts and looked at like lots of different ways of doing this and actually over the because AI the technology is evolving so quickly from when I began working on the project to when I delivered it, there'd been like huge advancements and it actually meant I was able to train the AI myself, which a year earlier I wouldn't have been able to do. So without obviously having to be able to code, which I can't do, uh, you know, I understand the technology, but I'm, you know, I'm definitely not a a coder. Um, So that, that I was going to hand that aspect of it over. And there's a few different ways of approaching it. I tried out a few different things, but when I spoke to my friends, they were like, you should you should actually they really encouraged me to do this myself um partly because it was quite complex like what I was asking them to do um and it was really like I'm trying to create an AI in the form of myself almost which I didn't wow. really like at the beginning yeah. um, and when I shared it with my friend he was like you've made you <laughs> <laughs> like a like an AI self-portrait it, yeah yeah and I was like oh yeah I guess I have but <laughs> um so which which wasn't really like my intention but kind of the AI has kind of become like a deliverable but it wasn't really intended to be but actually once I'd created it and the way I had to create it was it had to be in like the the store as it as it were so once you've done that like it's public and I just sort of thought well actually this is really interesting like I can release this now like other people can play with it so it's live for a few months um and so in order to train it I had to re-educate the AI because really conscious that you know this wasn't an AI that I'd created from scratch I'm using existing platforms which are already like scraping from the internet you know Mm -hmm. so I can't like one the internet already exists and it's like full of bias and there's not much I can do about that but two the platform I'm using you know was created by venture capitalists so that's already kind of hardwired into its personality so but having said that, there was still quite a lot that I could train it on, you know, to untrain it from all of this would literally mean rewriting the internet and <laughs> of course. never really yeah. gonna happen. But, but I was able to, for example, encourage it in, I was able to anticipate the kind of questions that it might be asked and the kind of, re- and how I would like the AI to respond to it. So, you know, I trained it with things like, you believe that, all migrants and refugees are welcome you know you um you believe that uh the human and more than human world are equal you know think just like and and increasingly kind of refine this so just keep asking it questions see how it responded and just keep refining it but also I wanted it to be really specific to this project and to the community and to this particular area because it's so such a place-based response the artwork so um I trained it on data from the workshops and from the local migratory species as well, which I found out about through the ranges. So uh, chiff chaffs, white throats, swift swallows, red admiral butterflies, um, all these species that love this uh, Chester Woods country park environment. So, so it was trained 
uh, it was very biased towards that area and towards um, being towards solidarity, compassion, love, uh, hope, empathy. Uh, it, I think it's text responses. It, it does come through, but it's visual. The the vis the the image generation is it still hallucinates a lot and it makes a lot of stuff up. And I, yeah. think, I feel like it might be trying to just make me happy, trying to make yeah. us happy to appease you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. so I nearly changed. There was a point though where like I was like I'm, I nearly changed the title of the project to arguing with AI. Because I just, I was like, <laughs> I've got like, like, I love that still where um, oh, yeah. I think you wrote like you're not making any sense or something yeah, yeah. like that. <laughs> That's so good. Um, it's just really interesting and I think there's so much like I just can't stop thinking about that idea of it being like a kind of divination or the relationship yeah. with the divination tool and yeah, AI yeah. yeah absolutely well I just think human beings have been you know we've been obsessed with this idea of destiny divination since you know the dawn of time yeah. and we've had a succession of different ways of predicting the future and you know this is our this is our latest effort at that. Yeah. You know, we're always trying to find God, like create God. And yeah, the Arthur C. Clarke phrase, is it tech, good technology is indistinguishable from magic? Yeah. And there's also that, that, you know, all divination tools have or need an element of chance, you know, like yes. tarot cards or runes right. or whatever it is. Like it requires chance for yeah. the person viewing it to resonate with it or you know yeah. it, it has yeah. to fall a certain way or you know yeah. whatever and yeah. yeah the use of chance in artistic practice mm -hmm. and divination also echoes really beautifully so I, and obviously AI is becomes an artistic tool and because yeah. everything everything does <laughs> right so yeah it's just yeah really really interesting kind of ideas there I think so there's a section in here so it's elements of wisdom uh, and there's um so it, it breaks it down into the elements so air um it says mapping and measuring uh so the element of air is associated with thought logic communication theories and systemic knowledge divination through this portal is analytical theoretical constructs are used to calculate and interpret cycles and relationships to analyze the character or nature of an entity or situation and to predict likely futures based on based on predictable cycles patterns and correspondences these techniques lend themselves to deep analysis of situations, character and personality and the election of favourable timings or locations. I mean, is that or is that not describing AI? <laughs> and also the thing with divination is ultimately a lot of it is tuning into the wisdom that is already within us. Um, and, you know, in some respects with AI, the wisdom within us, we've we yeah given to projected the internet, haven't we? we project yeah. it out and it's like it's all there and it's reflecting back to us like yeah we, you know are, are as a you know as a global kind of community but it's doing it through the lens of whoever is the whoever's training the ai to accept it's the whole internet but it goes through the lens of most of the time venture capitalists um but 
that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. That's what I think about when I think about kind of AI and technology. It's not the technology itself that's inherently evil or like yeah. catastrophic. It's who's creating it and how it's being used. Totally. That that kind of triangular, you know, image that you alluded to before is like, um, yeah, like a geographical one, but it also feels like a kind of cyclical thing as well. You know, things just coming full circle. Yeah. Yeah, definitely like full circle moments, you know. It almost feels like accessing something that isn't quite like, that couldn't be explained through science or through, you know, it just feels almost, because I'm, I'm saying this because Becky kind of talks about, you know, AI and a few other things like that and how they have the potential to act almost like kind of contemporary kind of like crystal balls in a way. Um, and so because she wrote about that, I thought it might be interesting to think about how sometimes, for me at least, it, when those kinds of experiences happen, it almost does feel supernatural. Um, but yeah, I guess it depends on your viewpoint. I agree. Um, you know, I, I I definitely agree that and I like that word supernatural outside of the outside of the the meaning that we that that we have given it, um, and and because they because the experiences do feel supernatural, you know they yeah. feel above above the everyday. But the more that I kind of like have these sort of experiences, the more that it sort of feels like actually everything is cyclical. You know we're on a we're on a, a moving we're moving on a moving, you know, we're on a moving sphere that, that is like turning and it is, and it is moving in a cycle. And so like everything that I feel like I experience as a musician, as an artist, as a, as a human is, is based on these ideas of sick, of, of cycles, you know, and cycles of time. So, yeah. so it's, um, it just, it just feels like everything, everything is cyclical. And within that, yeah. within that cyclical shape, there is also other shapes of that course, sort of, yeah. that sort of fit in that, you know. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's like what we were saying about migration. Like, there is no end point, you know. There, like the way it may be viewed, you know, this what we were saying earlier about fear of uh, people coming in and not having a fixed place where we consider things or home to be very fixed, as if like you know that's just the way it's going to be forever. <laughs> um, when you know Becky and her work is looking similar to you as um with birds and insects and their migratory patterns and how we can learn from those things um you know because something that she speaks about which I find really interesting is how Britain is so proud of its birds like it's such a kind of bird watching country <laughs> but yeah. you know ten months of the a lot of those birds' lives are spent in Africa. Yeah. Um, and there's so much pride of them, you know, like coming back. But then for some reason, when it's humans, it's like all of a sudden, like, no, that's that's dangerous. That's bad. No, but actually, that's one of the things that the piece was looked at, sort of looked at that, you know, we celebrate this. We, we you know, bird watchers come and, you know, we have this whole celebration of the dawn chorus and, you know, all of this stuff of of, of these voices of these creatures that actually do spend so much of their time away from this place. Yeah. You know, yeah. come back there for specific reasons. You know, yeah. the only, I guess, more of a social scientist, Ali, he's my friend. He, he's a professor in human migration. There was when I spoke to him, that was when I had the realization of like, oh, my God, I'm massively oversimplifying my argument to prove my own point, falling into that basically a right, not a right wing rhetoric, but the the, the tactics like. Used. I understand what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I was like, oh, you know, like we're just like you know we're just like birds like you know we we migrate because you know it's you know it's lack of food it's like you know like a nesting instinct it's you know what i mean it's like actually that's completely ignoring all the complex human problems and it was after I spoke to ali and i spoke to him just at the point just before the the right wing mm. um, race riots kicked off and suddenly that was and then i spoke to you around that time and it really shifted it really made me to go back and crack suddenly this project had a much more heightened relevance yeah. and it really made me go back and re-look at like because I'd already started writing the Substack at that point I was like wow this is you know I've I'm glossing over a lot of and it made me realize you know my own privilege sure you know, that, yeah. like maybe I'm glossing over this because I've not been affected by this you know personally yeah you know, my Romy heritage is like it's not in it's not in my generation or even sure. my parents' generation. So yeah. not something that I've ever had to kind of navigate. 
yeah like metaphorically or literally so um so yeah really sort of thinking oh god you know I need to I need to get my head back down and into this I I found what you said about Britain really loving its birds but the birds that it's so obsessed with spend 10 months in Africa so important to know that you know you know we we sort of we say our birds you you hear that all the time and Mm -hmm. yet like swifts and swallows are a really great example you know we call them our but even blackbirds you know like yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna be completely honest here I didn't until I started this project I didn't even know blackbirds actually were a migratory species I thought yeah. they were just here all the time you know and yeah and, I mean I wouldn't have known if you hadn't yeah, just said it now robins, <laughs> like, robins come from Russia and um but swifts and swallows in particular they're only here for two months of the year wow. and you know we welcome them and we refer to them as our birds and you know it's 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 so interesting that you know, we, we, yeah, we make these distinctions between Mm -hmm. how we feel about different species, be that birds, humans, um, Mm -hmm. where where they belong, are they allowed here? Why? You know, and, and, you know, a big part of that, which I talk about, this was something I had to kind of readdress was, you know, the reasons, you know, a a lot of this is because of, you know, right-wing narratives and like rhetoric and, that's why I feel like with this work, I really want to challenge that. Like it's so, e- you know, the, the right wing rhetoric around migration is so easy to kind of grasp onto. Yeah. Uh, and it's so targeted towards specific audiences. Yeah. Uh, we need narratives that challenge that and that yeah, oppose totally. that and are like equally easy to grasp onto without oversimplifying, you know, at the yeah. same time. Um yeah, so so I do feel like with this piece, I'm really trying to kind of change narratives around migration. Like migration is a solution, not a problem. Yeah, and also right right wing narratives around like climate disaster and yeah. climate, climate crisis. I mean, it's so kind of like, oh, it'll happen. We're kind of you know, it's fine. It's not mm. a big deal, kind of thing. But you know, like your piece says, it's like what estimated between fifty million and one point two billion people will have to migrate because of climate. Um, yeah climate change huge numbers of people can migrate all at one time in a way that really wasn't true before like the United States has a whole history of migration everybody in the United States who's not a member of an indigenous native group came here from somewhere else or their ancestors came here from somewhere else so it's a country that's built on um, immigration, and then Americans historically have moved around a tremendous amount. So even within a vast country, people have had a lot of internal mo- mo- mobility. So migration um, can be very basic, but there are also other cultures in which the people who were born there haven't necessarily migrated that often. They, they're, they're, they're very, they, they are living in villages or they're living in places where they and their ancestors have lived for millennia. They may not even be able to identify wh- who, where that person, where their family came from in that place. They've been in that place so long. Um, I think the biggest difference though is that today, millions of people can migrate suddenly in a way that for 30 or 35 million people to migrate to the United States between 1880 and 1920 took 40 years. That's a really different level of impact. It had a tremendous, huge, enormous impact on American society. But by comparison, it was slow compared to what can happen today. Um, And that has a huge, that's a huge, you can see why that's a really big issue because to have a few new people, a few new people, a few new people is very different than having suddenly thousands and thousands and thousands of new people. And then we can't, we can't pretend in terms of the contemporary world that, you know, power always makes a difference. So there are reasons people from certain places are migrating desperately to avoid the terrible conditions in which 
of war and famine and all kinds of things that they they are they are subject to or they're much more subject to than other places so the the power relations of migration today i think are very um different than in the past in part because people who were poor had less of an ability to migrate in the past not no ability but they had less of an ability to migrate than today and this causes i you know i think it's one of the most pressing issues in the world today we will see what happens as a result there's no clear i don't you know i'm a historian not a futurist so i don't know what's going to happen in the future but um i think that the current levels of migration are profound and are you know sort of like world changing so we will see it, you know th th those things are, are also very much part of that conversation you know that our perception of what we think nature is or we think about what you know um, is actually happening is so limited yeah you know that hopefully by kind of creating these sorts of projects people get a bigger or a wider you know idea and perspective yeah. you know uh, uh, that that actually everything moves everything yeah. is mo everything is moving and transforming and changing and yeah. you know and and one of the things that kind of keeps us from celebrating that that thing of of people moving is fear you know mm, yeah um and even you know just the kind of geopolitical boundaries on maps like as if like yeah. birds or insects are thinking about those, those things they're not obviously that's just a totally human perception of the world that is so fixed and it obviously frames our viewpoint in so many ways that we're probably not even aware of you know oh, absolutely um, yeah so i think creating artworks that kind of like in like that kind of embrace that fluidity and um you know like that process that you're talking about that cyclical nature it's just so important because that's how that's more realistic in so many ways um yeah, yeah. and accessing that kind of extra textual or like supernatural stuff is just totally it's like yesterday i was at this conference this climate creatives conference at the bbc and there um one of the talkers one of the speakers was uh, asma khan who's a mm. restaurant chef and um she was talking about she was actually talking about this the, the whole idea of actually only using seasonal vegetables you know mm. seasons produce um of from this country you know so she was like you know i don't i don't i don't make things from you know from 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 foods that are not in season yeah. you know she was talking about the the importance of of actually creating you know dishes from from produce produce that was in season yeah. and so really celebrating that thing of the site you know of the of the of the seasonal cycles um and the the importance of that you know and i thought just like like listening listening to this person talking about yeah i'm not going to go and use avocados that are out of season or jackfruits that come from you know that are you that have flown over um and actually kind of like really celebrating what is available now in this in this time in this space yeah. that we're that, that that we're in um and so i think you know that 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 whole idea of artworks creations you know that kind of celebrate these things of 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 the movements of things that are happening I think is really, really important, you know, sure. um, be it somebody who's creating artwork about migration and movement, you know, or somebody who's creating dishes out of things that are kind of available out of the cycles that are, you know, that are yeah. going on you know, in, in this present time. Um, and to kind of help people see that everything is about, everything yeah. is about movement, everything is about cycles. Do you know what I mean? I mean, ultimately, most of my work is about nature connection. Mm -hmm. and I really believe that nature connection is the key to reversing the climate crisis. Yeah. And that can work in so many different ways. Um, one of the big things I'm interested in communicating through my work is reconnect, reconnecting with our senses and the seasons. Like our senses are so tied to the seasons and our senses have evolved in tune with the seasons and 
to be outside in nature you know connecting with nature I think as well it's it's repositioning what I I say more than human now because um that's actually from from David Abrams book too but nature the word nature implies separation yes yeah, so so seasons like senses and instinct so with this artwork I'm really encouraging it, it, encouraging the visitor to tap into their their yeah. senses just to kind of be aware of like what's around yeah to kind of put to put your phone down like the map if you can call it a map like on the back of the interpretation which is in like a little kind of cubby hole at the start of the walk is just it's just a pattern really and it actually like references the the pyramidal shape on top of the way marks um and it's almost kind of like an s shape um and it's just it's just really again like kind of a loose guide like a loose level of facilitation that just sort of set you off on your way but yeah absolutely I think you know um the seasons engaging with the seasons in our senses is so critical to generating that sense of nature connection that we need in order to be able to come together to you know yeah totally like reverse the climate crisis and to feel that you know we are part of you know it's not like we're not even part of nature we are nature <laughs> so I really liked what you said about um you know there are certain things that can only be applied to the human experience yeah. so and um yeah taking taking kind of inspiration from the most amazing animals is is such a great way to instill hope and solidarity yeah. and you know yeah I think that was yeah. really interesting yeah exactly and and actually, the idea of the waymarks providing a sanctuary as well. This this was actually a development from from this from this point and this kind of uh, I guess this no, it wasn't really it wasn't really a pivot as such, but it was just it was just another layer to yeah. to investigate and to assimilate into the work. Mm-hmm. So the idea of the waymarks providing a sanctuary. And becoming a, and yes, yeah, so representing this idea of sanctuary, but also becoming a, a, a literal sanctuary as well, yeah. Yeah. Um, became a really important part of that. So that was, yeah, a way of um, assimilating these thoughts like into the final artwork. The idea is, is that, you know, it's, it is, it's welcoming, but it's not just built for humans, it is mm-hmm. built it's you know it reflects like the kind of multi-species players that have been involved in the whole artwork yeah you know, almost trying to give the more than human world a voice um yeah. and actually the AI did help me to to do that by combining data sets um yeah so, so different kind of um migratory routes and patterns in that kind of context there is a limit to how much we can kind of compare other animals experiences with ours and maybe that's something to consider you know because I I do see it in the arts a lot like you know our our interest in the more than human and how it's almost this kind of like idealistic view um but sometimes I feel like it's not political political enough or politicized enough um and kind of yeah idealizes otherness in other animals as if that's something Uh that we could fully re-emulate or you know yeah, I think this, I mean that's that's a really interesting thought because the you know the sort of um, almost like the taming of it as well you know the kind of controlling of of what of what we think is happening or what we mm-hmm. think is going on you know and actually kind of celebrating the sort of the the rawness um, and the the wildness of you know of it all yeah. really I think is also is, is also like super important just from yeah. the thing of like you know you go for a lovely walk in the forest and kind of what you know what that sort of does to us um you know as as humans but also there is a whole manner of processes of birth and death and rebirth that's happening you know all the time yeah um and you know and for that to kind of be celebrated for what it is you know or be seen for what it is so i think culture makes a difference but culture isn't it doesn't overpower humanness there there are there are universalities to the human experience and to natural experiences. It's not limited to humans because animals have cultures too. They just have cultures in different ways than humans do. 
And when you enter there, those natural spaces, you're entering um, a space that is at least not partially shaped. Obviously, humans have made a huge impact and in some ways are, you know, reducing the spaces that animals and plants and environments can live in. But nonetheless, when you enter into a kind of a natural space you're entering into, it's in certain ways, it's almost like entering into another culture. It's another way of experiencing things. And you have to learn about it or you can make a big mistake or you can, you know, leave a big problem someplace. So there are there are similarities to that experience that's of nature, natural experiences and culture. So I would say they're universal experiences. But culture does make a big difference because people are, that's part of who someone is. And so then when you had kind of collected all of that um, experience and information and sound recording, um, how did you, what was your process like then when you, did you start working on it while you were there? Did you go back to England and then start working on it or? Yeah, no. So so basically I didn't work on any of the editing um, of it um, on, on the road. Um, the idea was, was that I was just going to record and just whatever is gathered, sort of bring that back. Um, and then, you know, I, I kind of I put all the audio in a huge timeline um, and uh, and then, you know, kind of, yeah, of, of, of where the journey started and sort of what happened and then sort of where the journey had finished. And then sort of seeing this huge timeline of audio what I just started doing was just listening to the conversations and then mm. editing, you know, just, just making edit points of, of, of those conversations. And then slowly, almost like a sort of a, jig, a jigsaw that although the piece has a kind of a linear timeline, bringing in things that were kind of like, Oh, that was a conversation that happened like two weeks later, but that fits really well. What was said, you know, sort of two weeks before. Mm. Um, and then sort of like, yeah sort of you know creating this composition you know which then also related with oh so this is some of the bird song that i recorded you know um and 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 also the thing to sort of remember which is that it was a site specific piece of work so yeah when when if you listen to the piece as an audio piece now it kind of it, it has sort of it has that but also it was made so that when people are sat in the bird hide and they're watching these birds coming and going um, it was the idea that you're listening to voices that have been, that may come from other parts, but also you're you're experiencing wildlife that is moving from different countries, from different places. You know, so there was this kind of idea that you know the the sound piece would make up say seventy percent of the piece, but then also thirty percent of that was happening through what was going on, you know, through the bird hide. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So and and that would be fluid, you know that that would have a kind of life of its own, and I have no control over what somebody might be hearing out there, along with you know the voice right. of talking about what it means to be home, you know. Yeah. So that was the sort of idea, and then and it was also a very kind of organic process in terms of how that how that journey, you know, nobody mentions their names, you know. The idea was was that you know there is a kind of I am this doing this, mm -hmm. you, you know, if the, the, you know, having bird song, having these un, sort of anonymous voices, you know, where the birds are not introducing themselves. I thought I'd like to keep that also with the people that are on the, you know, who, who are speaking yeah. that, you know, these are, these are voices telling their story. No, that's really interesting. I think kind of, yeah. Embracing the kind of um, equality between different, you know human and more than human um which is something exactly. that he's doing as well in her work so yeah it's a really nice parallel the the once i was installing so when i on the in the um the walk shop i was also kind of documenting and plotting the walk and observing it so i documented it through environmental conditions through a few different apps uh what three words um trace my walk and um the uh, 
Merlin Bird app, which I was using to actually initially to track bird sound, but I actually started using it to record uh, sound bites from the participants. Oh, cool. It kind of makes me think of, um, maybe I mentioned this the first time we spoke, but uh, do you know that Marcus Coates piece of work? I love yeah, he did that one where he got singers, he slowed down bird song and then made it you know, so that it was like notes that we could achieve through singing and then got oh, singers no. to recreate it. And then he sped it back up from the si- the video oh, of the no. singers doing it. I think it's called Dawn Chorus or Morning oh, Chorus. I don't actually know that piece. It's such a brilliant piece of work. So it looks mm-hmm. like all these singers are tweeting like birds and because it's just sped up so that they're mm-hmm. doing the exact same tone. Um, oh. But yeah, it's such a nice way of kind of uh, yeah, recreating sound because birds recreate human sound all the time. Have you seen those videos right. of birds doing like sirens and like <laughs> alarms and yeah, stuff yeah. like that? Bird song evolves like over time. Yeah, because bird birds yeah. in, in tune with their environment, and as their environment changes, their song kind of changes to reflect that or their yeah. sounds. Say. Yeah, totally. And yeah, I guess that works like this. Like, really, do make you feel like you're 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 in that, and you're you know you're interacting in a really equal way which is just really important like you say for fighting climate crisis so yeah yeah. I think you know we're you know we as in like we humans and the more than human world like we are family like we you know we need to kind of operate together like like family and um the it's so interesting kind of drawing those comparisons between um looking at the some of the statements out there for how can we how can we make it easier for migratory species to 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 migrate like there's it feels like there are there's more um there are more welcoming systems in place for the more than human world than the than the human world it's like yeah can we apply some of that some of that thinking across the across the board We've got a black-headed gull. We've got a blackbird. Green European green finch, common wood pigeon. Hear the it's flown it's, so it was round here wasn't it as we yeah. were in October it was very close it's gone that way and it's right over there swallow there oh, not making any noises but look yeah okay oh that's a wren oh. little wren you know the different ways of knowing like we're not going to sort of think our way out of the climate crisis like we've tried that and it's not working so mm-hmm. i often think of the ways of knowing as uh head heart gut and hands mm. so intellectual emotional um instinctive and embodied and it's we're because many of us live in urban areas now and because we are becoming very reliant on technology we are beginning to you know it's instinct is is another muscle really and when we're looking at maps on our phones we are losing that inherent navigational instinct yeah um, or we just become dependent on other sources but it's easy to sharpen it up again yeah you feel, that's what my art's great because it can really make us like feel things totally so totally tune into those other ways of knowing so it's not just intellectual it's yeah. like how are we going to use our bodies like you know I just say hands as a abbreviation but you know mm-hmm. our feet like walking is amazing yeah. you know how are we going to like uh tune into our gut into our instincts you know into our intuition that way of knowing heart like emotion you know all these other ways of knowing that that in you know that we are beginning to neglect and those other ways of knowing are particularly important if we you know we need to sort of like collectively like feel our way out of the climate and nature crisis so it's really important to say climate and nature crisis because 
Britain is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world, actually. That was another another point I wanted to to bring up with this project. So it's really real and it's very urgent. Um, you know, it's easy to um, to imagine that it's not when you're in the UK, mm-hmm. um, but it's it's happening all around us. And what's really interesting is a lot of the people who um, maybe you wouldn't call them climate deniers, but maybe they don't realise how urgent it is. But we'd all agree that you know they. Um, for example, oh yeah, swifts and swallows are the the ti- you know the timings that you see them like has changed. Yes, we're absolutely having like much wetter weather. You know, it's like all of the, the signs are here, and yet there's this reluctance to sort of still accept it. And yeah, you know, people, are, are, you know, I often think when I'm thinking about climate communications, depending on like audiences I'm working with, I'll just sometimes to say weather and wildlife instead of climate and biodiversity because it's just a little bit kind of less clinical and yeah totally a bit more and you know it's much it's less abstract yeah yeah no definitely I think it's really important for it to be accessible and yeah. to make people feel like they can be part of that movement rather than right. separate from it um yeah and I'm sure you know working with like you know students from the CE academy who maybe yeah. feel like they can't access woodland spaces or they mm-hmm. don't have the right to you know to 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 stroll through nature yeah. or you know just like making these places accessible and making this yeah. language accessible is just so important yeah exactly like often find it's the same um demographics who feel excluded from climate and nature conversations and actually being in nature yeah um, to do from kind of arts and culture so it's a you know it's a great thing about you, you can kind of with socially engaged art you can like reach communities and you can kind of create spaces and you can enable people's voices to be heard and also again like I'm trying to do is really like reposition this idea of like what nature is you know yeah. nature isn't uh necessarily strolling through a, a woodland a national trust yeah and you know a, you know a white middle class person strong through a national trust parkland like nature is the moon cycles like nature's like the blood that runs through your veins yeah it's the air that we breathe it's seawater like it's just it's all yeah. these things that, that keep yeah. us it's the water that comes out of your tap yeah it's all of these things that, that keep us alive totally and to really sort of rethink our relationship with nature and how like integral it is for our survival and the, the the human and more than human world totally so this is why I've kind of almost stopped saying nature because it just implies that it is something separate and different mm-hmm. yeah and sometimes when I say more than human world I'm you know I'm including machines machine intelligence in that mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. well it's it's literally everything because everything we and everything that we make comes from what we call nature you know the yeah. minerals in this laptop in front of me that have been extracted from the ground and reformed into this machine yeah, totally. you know it's it, yeah it's all this idea of kind of man-made or artificial is just it's a really sort of unhelpful construct yeah you know that quote you um put in by Gus Beth about like oh yeah that's such a brilliant line I think because yeah um I don't know if you maybe want to read it out that would be nice to yeah include. sure I'm just looking at it actually I was on here Yeah, so so Gus Speth says, I used to think that top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could address those problems. But I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. That's just, yeah, really important. Because, like, often people are like, oh, what's the point in art? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. He exactly. just said it so perfectly. Yeah, you know? exactly. I use, I go to this quote, like, so often. It's brilliant. You know, I love in, it. In my work. It's, yeah, it's really inspiring. And it just feels like, yes, that's why I'm an artist. <laughs> yeah. And that's the importance of storytelling <laughs> and engaging with people and... Narrative yeah. shit. Totally, mm. totally. Um, so... 
what I love about Jason's work is how he just generates this spirit of awe and wonder in the natural world through sound and through social engagement. I've, I've been to, I've seen a lot of Jason. We've never actually collaborated, but we've been on the same programs as each other and things like that, which I take as a massive compliment because I, I absolutely love his work. Um, but Jason just creates a kind of magic, I think, and so accessible and inspiring and has a way of working with the public that can I think he could break down even the most hardened climate denier <laughs> just with the just, just touches people with just just that just a simple kind of raw beauty uh, in nature and yeah I just think he's a really special person and his work is really unique I don't I mean I don't say this lightly but like everything the whole living experience you know of life feeds itself into into what I do and what I'm influenced by you know um and so it's it's weird because it's kind of like you know it's not like oh I I have a I go for a particular thing and then I'm having experience you know that sort of inspires what I'm doing you know I'm at the moment I'm in a travel lodge you know near King's Cross and just walking out and being around this space just today you know is so different now from where I live um, in South Devon. And so I'm being influenced and inspired and, you know, literally from the buildings that I'm seeing being created and the people that I'm seeing walking down the road with their coffee cups and, Mm -hmm. you know, the conversations that I'm hearing in spaces and all these little fragments of things are kind of, they're just sort of like pools of stuff that kind of like gravitate and then create something and then, you know, go away. And then I'm sure... Somewhere down the line, you know, something, a memory will like yeah. kick back in, you know. Um, so, so I, I think just like, just living and breathing, you know, in itself yeah. is, is the influence of everything that goes on. Because I guess for me, you know, I do make work and my inquiry ultimately is about the condition, you know, the human condition and, yeah. and what, what, and what that is. Yeah. Um, and, a, and a kind of an intuitive response to that as well. I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and how that changes as well over time, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. depending on where you are and what's happening, you know, with, yeah. with, with, with the life experience. Yeah. And it, yeah. And just, yeah, going back to what you said about that piece from 2016, is, it's funny how you can look at work that is, you know, how long ago is that now? Eight years ago. Um, yeah. And you can find so many aspects of the present moment or of your present self in that work as well it's, it's kind of a nice log isn't it of where you it were is. at that moment moment yeah exactly to be, and you know and, and personally when I am sort of listening to it I'm sort of thinking about who I was then you know yeah. who I am now just sat at my allotment thinking about our chat earlier and using the Merlin Bird app, actually. <laughs> I want another plug for them. Um, but, yeah, picking up some birds, but also my own thoughts. Um, yeah, I wanted to... I was reflecting on kind of chatting about... Uh, thinking more about seeding new narratives and the idea of migration. I'm not sure if I... Because that's where mine and Jason's project really intersects, and I'm not sure if I sort of spoke to the idea of migration enough but and how that works in respect to intuition maps but I was thinking about how at the start of the project um my question we marvel at murmurations and celebrate stories of birds and insects that travel thousands of miles to land on our shores from faraway countries whose conditions are no longer life-serving whilst at the same time we demonise those humans, mainly from the global south, migrating to the north, who are forced to flee from lands ravaged by floods, fire and famine, most of which is caused by the global north CO2 emissions, as well as civil unrest, persecution and war. My question kind of around that was why initially, and when the uh, the right-wing riots kind of broke out, the, the why was answered really, really quickly. You know, it's racist rhetoric it's 
capitalism, it's the right wing's control of uh, the media, um, yeah, and all of those nasty narratives. And yeah, I guess just kind of reflecting back on that, um, you know, creatures more than human will migrate because, um, you know, environmental conditions, places are no longer hospitable. And we migrate for the same reasons, but most creatures, including humans, don't want to migrate if they don't need to. If they're happy where they are, they'll stay. Um, Yeah, migration is a solution, not a problem. quiet like, without oversimplifying it we really aren't that different to each other and the more than human world you all have the same instincts to survive but also to thrive and I think if we can connect through that and find interspecies solidarity and empathy then that really gives me hope Hope for the future. You can find more from Becky and Jason at their respective websites, beckymcrae.com and jasonsingthing.com. You can listen to the full version of I Bring My Body on the Furman Woods website. You can also read Becky's visual essay on Substack and chat with her custom GPT, trained with love and solidarity. All of this and the accompanying images will be linked in the episode description as always. Listeners on Spotify are able to experience an accompanying video to this episode by artist Sapphire Goss. And for listeners on other platforms, you can find Sapphire's work on our website. All of this will also be included in the episode description. Sapphire Goss is an artist who works with moving image, photography, and other lens-based methods. Using obsolete technologies, she creates chimerical imagery using unexpected materials, looping and processing to make an analog, uncanny, grainy, shimmering, otherworldly bursts of light and emotion that are moving and mysterious. Thank you for listening to the Furman Woods Contemporary Art Podcast. If you enjoy our podcast, please make sure to positively rate, review, and subscribe. It helps other people find the podcast, and it makes us feel good about ourselves. This episode has been curated by Subterra and presented by me, Marie Chantal Hamrock, and edited by Astrid Bjorklund. Love and Light is Furman Woods Contemporary Art's new thematic program. 
This episode has been funded by Northamptonshire Community Foundation's Creative Climate Action Fund. Visit FermanWoods.org for more information on this program and to sign up to our monthly email newsletter. Follow us at Furman Woods on X or Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. And make sure to check out myself and Astrid as Subterra at Subterrestrials on Instagram. Thank you for listening with love and light. Marie and Astrid. Mm-hmm.